paper and by the microphone to get that little semi-short sound. All right, anyhow, this is Mike Zellers, and this is CISS 143. And before we begin, I want to say a couple words about the recording of this class. As you can tell, uh, this class is a little different than, than maybe some of your classes, and that is in this room. And you'll notice there I'm being recorded. There are all these video screens and all that. I do this for a number of reasons. I wish I could do this for all my class, but we're the, we don't have enough rooms equipped to do that. But I am able to do it for a, a pretty good number of my classes. I think three out of the four that I have on campus this term, I'm doing this way. And I do it for a couple reasons. I do it, um, my original goal was to do this um, for the students that are in my online sections. You know, there's a campus section for this, and there's also an online section for this. Um, it's great that the folks in the online section have a lecture that they can refer to, as opposed to just reading everything in the book. Uh, I will say the you know database concepts, some of them are kind of tricky, and to be able to participate at least that way, I think really enriches the students in the online class. But in addition to the online class, you know, people in my campus class get ill, have to work late, have a uh, you know have to go away for business or or for some kind of family emergency or whatever, and are are apt to miss a class or two here or there. People have a lot of responsibilities, and by recording the classes, what I do is I uh, you know that is uh, that gives the option that gives the ability for students that aren't able to attend the class to to view the class. All right, so I think it's really a win-win uh, for everyone. Um, <coughs> One thing to note is if you look in front of you, there's a little thingy on the, on the table. And that's actually a little microphone. And if you press that, um, I get a shock. No, I'm just kidding. I, I don't get a shock. Although, yeah, everyone's going to be trying it out now, right? No. Uh, if you press that, what will happen is your microphone will go on and the camera will turn on you and then you can ask a question. Um, no one has ever pressed a button in one of my classes. Uh, most people are a little camera shy or, or whatever. So you don't have to do that. But what I will do, and, and you can sort of remind me to do, is if someone does ask a question, I will try to repeat the question out loud. You know, um, Like if you raise your hand and say, when's the assignment due? You know, I'll repeat it and say, when's the assignment due? It's due on Tuesday or something along those lines. That way, the people watching the video can hear and benefit from your, from your, uh, from your, your question and, and, and the answer that we give and the discussion. So periodically, I, I try to do that. And if I, if I forget, you can kind of discreetly remind me one way or another. All right. What I want to do today is twofold. I want to, uh, first of all, just introduce you to the class and, and introduce you to the stuff that we're going to be doing and, and how the class is going to be structured and that sort of thing. Um, and then, in addition, I want to begin with the material of the class. So it will roughly be broken down half and half, a little bit of half of introductory material uh, and then half of, of actual content uh, for the class. Let me begin by taking attendance. Now, this is one drawback. <clears throat> if you notice, uh, if you go and, and log on to Angel, um, you'll see that the, the campus and the web class are combined into one section. So when I read the names of people in this class, there's going to be a lot of folks that aren't here because they're registered for the online class. So you know, don't be alarmed if I read you know, 30 names, 15 of which are here, because the other 15 are, are in the online section or something along those lines. Um, so, let's run down this list. Paul Adkins. If I mispronounce your name, feel free to correct me. Rebecca Akers. Richard Armstrong. Lawrence Atkinson. Mark Burrile. Andrew Bartko. Mackenzie Bates. Corey Bodach, Bodich, uh, Christopher Bohatka. I'm glad you were here, Paul. Otherwise, I'd really be worried that I was in the wrong classroom. Sean Carey, Robert Cook. All right. Cody Dahl, uh, Susan Dean, Scott Fornoy. Dante Foster, 
Stacey Harrington, Andrew Hickerson, Dennis Howard, Elizabeth Leonardi, Holly Miller, Alan Mitschke, Jessica Mullins. I'm going to confess to need a little bit of help with this. Sibon Gill. Sibon Gill. Eileen Nunez. Brian Porter. Andrew Racher. Pippa Sabin. Charlene Schuler, Daryl Schumpert, All right. Jeremiah Smith, Richard Smith, Christopher Strobe, Christine Toth, Roger West, Oops. Julius Ibarra, Hani Zayed, all right, and me. How many of you are not familiar, uh, I'll ask the opposite question, how many of you are not familiar with ANGEL, which is the course management system here at LC? Have you, everyone at least had maybe one class on it where they've used it, okay. Uh, what I'll do then is I won't go over the very basics of it. What we'll do is we'll, we'll go over how ANGEL relates to what we're doing in this class. Do know that if you do have questions about ANGEL, you can always ask me in lab uh, when, when the time comes. Um, ANGEL is our course management system, as you know. And when you log on, you'll see your list of courses. And you can click on it and go to this course. Again, this course is a combine of both the online and the campus course, so you'll see there are more people in, in here. I really think that another thing that benefits is if we have discussions on the discussion forum, then there's more people involved in that as well. So I, I really think it's a, it's a good, good thing all the way around. All right. <clears throat> um, the communicate is where you can send me or other people in the class emails, reports, allow you to see your grades, but what we're really going to focus on today is the content tab because that's where really the course content uh, resides for the most part. We're going to run through um, some of these things. Um, I'm going to give you an overview of everything first, then we'll go back and do some of the things in more detail and some of the things we will talk about um, at a later time. All right. Getting started, please read this first, is largely a message for the online students that sort of directs them, sort of walks them through the process that I'm about to do with you right now, so we don't really need to look that, at that. Obtaining Office 2010, if you do not have Office 2010, there is a deal that is offered to students uh, through Microsoft. Um, which, uh, you know, hundred dollars is, is, you know, expensive, but it's cheaper than what you would pay otherwise. So, um, I guess that's, that's the good news uh, there. If you need Office 2007, you, or I'm sorry, 2010, uh, this is an option for you. Um, <clears throat> of course, you don't need to purchase it. You can always use the computers in our labs here. Uh, we, we have our regularly scheduled lab time, which is you know, immediately following class. We also uh, have the open lab here that has pretty wide range of hours that you can come to and work uh, if, you need, uh, if you need to. Course information are where sort of the fundamental documents uh, for this course are. Um, this one again is more for the online students. I'm going to explain you the way the content is structured. These three documents, I'm going to come back and talk about these two in a minute. I do want to talk about this one. This one's probably less relevant for this class than it is for some of my other classes. Um, I teach a lot of web development classes and in those classes students are always uh, wanting to know can they use images from a website as part of their projects. And in an educational context, 
you have a little more flexibility as far as the copyright law uh, as compared to uh, a, you know a private person or, or or an organization or a business or some commercial use, usage. So this sort of summarizes um, using stuff off of websites um, within an educational project. So take a minute to read through that. Again, it's probably less relevant for this class than it is for other classes, but I do post this document. The syllabus and communication methods, I'm going to spend uh, a few minutes talking about separately after I finish the overview of everything. Every week is going to have a folder. Um, some weeks might be combined into one folder. Um, sometimes I might ha actually have a folder for week three and four, for example. Um, these folders contain sort of a to-do list of the stuff that you need to do that talks about the readings uh, that you need to read and talks about, um, provides maybe in some cases additional resources and specifies what your homework assignment is. When you're completed with the homework assignment, there's a Dropbox immediately underneath it that you upload uh, your work to. In addition to these files, any example databases that I would create in class and the videos for these lectures will be posted to this folder as well. Um, the, the video for the lecture is typically posted, you know, within a few hours of the lecture finishing. So chances are, you know, by 10, 30, 11 at night, it'll, it'll be posted possibly even sooner. All right. Um, so if you miss a class, you know, it, it, this isn't live broadcast. It's, you know, about an hour or so after the, the, le the lecture will be available. And I'll post other things that are, that are relevant to, to the week. There, you know, other examples or stuff that we covered in class or activities and, and so on. So there will be a folder for this week. Um, listed in here is sort of a very basic introduction to the class. Along with a list of the things that I want you to do. The semester project, um, a, a, a good portion of your grade is comprised of a semester project and we will talk more about this in a couple classes. I do want to introduce you to the fact that you do have a semester project in this class and, uh, you know, and know that it's coming. Ideally, if you can read through um, the write-ups on the project, um, it'll make the discussion for the project a little clearer when we, when we go over it in class. All right, but we won't do that for another class or two. All right? We probably won't do it Thursday. We might do it Tuesday and next week or maybe the following Thursday. Within the next several classes, we'll talk in more detail about the project. Um, the project's divided into two portions. There's the design and there is then the finished product. Uh, one thing that I believe in, in all my classes and, 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 and for most anything that's done in IT is that to be successful that requires some level of planning. All right? And people have different styles, people have different ways of doing that, but um, most of the projects that I've seen that have gone wrong uh, go wrong because there was inadequate or misguided planning. And so one thing I try to focus on in this class is not just being able to do the stuff that you're going to do, but, but to think about it first and to think about the right things to do and then go and, and create what it is that you're going to create. Whether it be, as in this class, a database or in other classes, a website or even in my social marketing class, a marketing plan. All right? So there will be a plan uh, that you'll make uh, for this class and then there will be the finished product. Lastly, we have a discussion board where you can post questions and people from the online class can post questions. And I encourage you to look at this, you know, periodically throughout the week. And if there's a question you have, feel free to post it here. If you see someone else having a question, feel free to post it here as well. All right. Let's rewind now and look at these two documents, the communication methods and the syllabus. I try in my camp, in the, in the sections that I teach both on campus and 
online. Those are, those are some of my favorite classes to teach, all right, because I think I can offer in those classes students the best of both worlds. I can, I can offer them the, the, the convenience of doing things online, and I can offer them hands-on attention if they need that. So whether you're in the online class or in the campus class, there's a number of ways that you can get a hold of me to resolve any questions that you have. All right, and this sort of runs them down. First thing that you can do is if you are in the online class, you are welcome to come down here and sit in on the campus class section. All right, we are in BU 105 now, and eight to, we're, we're, the lecture is 8 to 9, the lab is 9 to 10 on Tuesdays and Thursdays, and, and any student that's in the online class, feel free to come in and, and sit in on this class. All right. It doesn't matter, and, and we'll be happy to have you, and you'll probably enrich the class for everyone by coming in. All right. For both the online students and the campus-based students, you are welcome to sit in on any of my other classes' lab period. All right. I have a total of four classes that meet on campus, um, a, a day and an evening class, both on Monday, Wednesday, and Tuesday, Thursday. And you're welcome to show up for any of those classes' labs, even though it's not our particular class. The lab time, for the most part, is a time for me to answer questions and maybe consult with people that are having difficulty with, uh, with things. So for the most part, if there aren't any questions or if there aren't anything I need to talk to students about. I'm just kind of sitting there waiting for someone to ask me something. All right. So what I decided to do is open it up and say, if you want to come to my CISS 216 lab, which is, let's see, Monday and Wednesday from 10 to 11 a.m., you're welcome to do so. If a student from that class wants to come into this class's lab and ask me questions about their project, they're welcome to do so. so I open up any of my lab periods for any of my students to come in, regardless if they're campus-based, online, whether they're taking that particular class or not. They can come in and ask me whatever questions are relevant to the, the, the issues they're running into. A lot of students took advantage of this last uh, term, and I think it worked out pretty well, so I'm going to continue to do that. If you want to pursue this option, let me know, and I'll tell you when all my labs are. All right. As soon as I can remember where all my labs are this semester. All right. I can remember a couple of them, but, but I still have to work on, on all of those. You're welcome, of course, to watch video recordings of this class. You are welcome to post to the discussion board. And what I would say is post to the discussion board things that you think the, the whole class would benefit from hearing. For example, if you had a question about something I said in lecture. You know, I, I was talking in lecture about data versus information, and the distinction maybe wasn't clear to you. You didn't really understand what I meant the different, when I explained the difference between data and information. Now, that's a question that maybe everyone in the class would benefit from hearing. So, post it to the discussion board. All right? And you know, I'll answer it, and other people can chime in with their thoughts. And it'll be like raising your hand and asking the question in class. All right? If there's something that maybe relates to your particular situation, like maybe your project you're having trouble doing something on, or you're not going to be in class and, and you, you're going to want to know what I'm going to talk about, or anything along those lines, something that relates strictly to you, it's probably better to send it to me via email as opposed to the discussion forum. That being said, it's no big deal either way. I would rather have you, you know, send me an email for something that could have been on the discussion board than just not ask at all. The bottom line is ask if you have a question, whatever means that, that you, you, you uh, address it. You can email me within ANGEL, all right, through the communications tab. If necessary, I can arrange to have online chat. I haven't done this terribly often. I may have done it a couple times, but that is an option. Uh, one thing that's difficult via email is that um, if you have a question and you ask it, you know, I might not check my email for a couple hours. By then you've moved on to do something else. Maybe you've gone to sleep or gone to your job or whatever. I respond to it, then I go to bed. All right, you get it, respond back. Sometimes there can be a little bit of lag in the communication there. 
Uh, the airline chat facility that's available with an angel might be one, one way to get around that. We can get on at the, we can arrange to have a time and we can go back and forth and, and you know, I can answer your questions immediately as opposed to sort of playing email tag. All right. You can, uh, we can arrange uh, to, to discuss it via the phone. Uh, here's my phone number. Um, you can leave me voicemail, but it, generally speaking, it's better to send me an email than to leave me voicemail. But I do know sometimes you don't have access to email. Office hours are these. 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. on Monday and Wednesday, 9 through 10 a.m. on Tuesday and Thursday, and they're effective next week. All right. And I can make other times available by appointment. Or you can send me email through LC's account. Lastly, there's the ace in the hole, the wild card. If none of these other means work, just talk to me about it. We'll figure something out. All right. Um, my aim is that, that if you are sincere about learning this material and uh, you're having difficulty, we'll figure a way to work our way through it. All right? If you meet me halfway and let me know that there's an issue, let me know there's some confusion or a problem, meet me halfway, talk to me about it, and, and we'll figure a way through it. All right. Last but not least is the syllabus. And I'm going to go in and read you word for word, every word. No, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to hit the highlights. On the top of the syllabus um, is some information about um, the class and um, ways to contact me. Um, sort of a summary of, of what was on that other page. The description and outcomes for this class um, are relevant because really that's, that, should, that should provide us with some focus. This is ultimately why we're here, to, to learn this stuff. And therefore, anything we talk about should be relevant to this stuff. And if it doesn't seem relevant to you, feel free to ask, like, why are we talking about this? What does that have to do with anything? All right. The textbook. I had a typo in the first version of the syllabus I had posted, and I said the fourth edition. The book is actually the fifth edition. If you happen to have the fourth edition, we can probably work our way through it, but the preference would be that you have the fifth edition. The instructor approach, this is probably the most meaningful sentence in it. This is your class, all right? Um, not my class. I'm here to help you learn the material. All right, and therefore, whatever I do should be focused around that. It doesn't do me any good to cover something just so I can say I cover it if no one gets it or if everyone's having a hard time with it. There are some very important concepts in this class, and the most important concepts we'll spend a lot of time on, and we can even spend more if we need to, because these concepts are the concepts that you're really going to take with you, all right? To be sure we do some stuff in access that, that is important and is good to know and all that. But some of the concepts of the, uh, on this course, such as database design, really is relevant whether you're talking about an access database or a SQL Server database or an Oracle database or anything like that. As long as there are going to be relational databases, it doesn't matter which one you're talking about. The concepts of database design and normalization and those things that we're going to talk about are going to be relevant. And more than relevant, they're going to be important. And dare I say more than important, they're going to be critical. So we're going to spend a lot of time making sure that we have it. That being said, if we need more, let me know through the asking of questions. I don't hand anything out as far as handouts. Everything is available on Angel. I urge you to check Angel a couple times a week between class. Um, I will post announcements if I'm not going to be here a, a given day. I'll post an announcement as soon as I know that. If I uh, found some material or uh, if there's a correction in, in the assignment or 
I just find maybe a resource that's worth reading, I will post that into announcements. So check Angel between there. In addition, your Angel email will contain feedback for me on your assignments. As I grade your assignments, I typically provide feedback. What I will do oftentimes, too, is I will say, talk to me about this in lab. All right? Sometimes it's hard really to describe in words what by talking to you face to face and pointing to something on the screen and that sort of thing I can answer in a couple minutes. It might take paragraphs and paragraphs to try to address that in an email. So if, you, if I indicate come talk to me in lab, come talk to me in lab about it because I've determined it's probably the best way to address that particular issue. Here's a bunch of general college policies. Here's my policy concerning late homework. I tend to be pretty flexible about that. I recognize that people have other responsibilities. But by the same token, I also recognize that um, people sometimes need the motivation to, to get the stuff in and get the stuff in on time. I don't want to penalize a student that is legitimately putting forth a solid effort, though and just for whatever reason is falling short, whether they be ill for a given week or, or there's something that's tricky and they just don't understand it or whatever. So the bottom line is if, is if you're running late on an assignment, work with me. Let me know what's going on. Let me know that you're having trouble with it and we can work through that. And I will be a lot more flexible in the grading of it if you do so, as opposed to simply disappearing, not saying anything, and then all of a sudden you know, three weeks later, turn something in. Read through the policy, I describe what I've said in summary in a little more detail. The grade will be based this way. There'll be pretty much weekly assignments. Not necessarily weekly, some weeks might be combined. You know, I might combine uh, a, a couple chapters or a couple weeks here or there. I know at the end of the semester I combine, combine the last couple weeks into one bigger assignment. But there's 30 points worth of homework uh, assignments. There is 20 points total for the project, 20 points for the midterm, 30 points for the final exam. This is the approximate schedule that we'll be going over, that we'll be following um, this semester. All right, any questions? Yes. 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 Um, that's one thing I don't like about the textbook is in my mind it does things a little out of order. It, it talks about database concepts, then a little bit about database design, then it throws SQL in there, then it talks a little bit more about database design. It makes more sense to me to, to talk completely about database design and then get that topic finished before we go on to the next one, a SQL. I don't know, I, I mean, there's probably benefits to doing it their way as well, but I'd, I'd rather talk about, that's such a critical concept in this class that I'd rather address it full force and take as long a time as we need and, before we move on to the next topic. But yes, that is correct, that's not a misprint. Other questions? All right. Businesses uh, typically, or any organization, really has uh, an IT department um, for a couple of reasons. One of the reasons is to just to support their day-to-day -day functioning, right? Um, sending bills out to their customers processing the cash that they receive in. These are the, just day-to-day -day things that an organization needs to do, all right, to stay in business. Um, you know, if you think here at the college, here at the college we have to um, be able to, to enroll people, be able to register people for classes, be able to enter grades, be able to provide transcripts and that sort of things. And with the volume of data, you know, we need information technology to do that, just to do the day-to-day -day things that our organization needs to do. In addition to those day-to-day -day things, just about any organization has a whole 
range of decisions that have to be made. All right? And they range from big decisions, important decisions, to smaller, more commonplace decisions. Let's think of our cafeteria over there. What are some decisions that the person that runs our cafeteria has to make? What are some decisions that they would have to make? Yes? Menu selection? Yeah. What to serve? All right. Yes? How much to purchase? How much food to order? Anything else? Yes? What to charge? What to charge? Um, anything else? How many operation? Pardon me? So, uh, how many employees to have? Right? Hours of operation. Hours of operation. All these are decisions that the person that runs the cafeteria needs to make, and they're important, right? If they're serving the wrong stuff, if they're serving stuff that everyone hates, obviously that's going to have an impact. If they have too many or too few employees hired, that's going to have an impact. Too many means that they're spending more maybe than they need to. Too few means you're going to be, a, uh, you know, maybe the service is going to slip. Maybe your customers are going to get disgruntled and, and not come back. Ordering food. Um, if you order too much food, what's going to happen? Well, it's likely to spoil. You know, it doesn't keep forever. If you order too little food, what's going to happen? You're liable to run out on any given day. All right? Neither of those things are good for, for a business. I, I remember, uh, I don't even remember where I would see this. Maybe like in, uh, you know, like, I don't know, just like in, in these silly little catalogs that you get. There was a thing called the executive decision maker. And what it was, it was a little coin, and you flipped it heads or tails, you know, making the joke that, you know, that's how managers make their decision. They flip a coin, and uh, they, uh, they, they come up with their decision. Obviously, we know that's not the case, right? Or we hope that's not the case, all right? How would the manager of the cafeteria go and make those decisions that we described? How would the manager know what to buy and how many people to have? Yes? All right. One would be off previous reports. If you want to know, for example, how much to buy this week, a good indicator might be how much you sold last week. All right? Anything else that they might look at? Customer surveys for satisfaction. If people would continuously saying, gee, I had to wait 20 minutes in line to get checked out, well, gee, maybe they need to hire someone else or whatever. Anything else that they might look at? To consider, for example, uh, to, how much to charge for something. What might you consider to, 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 to try to decide how much to charge for a meal? Yeah, the cost of the ingredients, you know, the, the amount that you're paying your employees, you know, all your costs and so on. Now, to use the terminology that people in information technology use, all right, there is data and there is information. And I would say the kind of things that the manager needs to decide how much food to buy, how many people to hire, uh, what to charge for a meal, and so on, would fall into the category of information. What then is data? How does data relate to information? Yes. Okay. Data is what you use to decide upon. Does anyone want to add to that or clarify that? Yes. Okay. Okay. Data is pieces. Did you want to? Okay. In a way, it's sort of the other way around. The information is sort of derived from the data. In information technology, the idea is that the data is the raw facts. The information is those facts 
processed in some way, organized, however you want to put it, into a usable form. Or to use a good word that businesses use, an actionable form. What do I mean by actual? It means you can do something with it. All right? Let's consider this. Let's say a business had revenue, a business took in $40,000 in July. All right? Is that good or bad? Who knows, right? You can't, that's a piece of data, right? Yet we know nothing about what that really means and what that indicates. Should the manager of the organization be elated or should the manager be, you know, uh, totally depressed, all right, at this piece of information? What if that business was a teenager's landscaping business? Wow, he did $40,000 worth in July. He's cutting a lot of lawns, all right? He's doing a great job. What if that $40,000 was a Microsoft corporation? Well, gee, you know, Bill Gates would be having a bad day then or, or something. All right? The point is, is this one fact isolated by itself is sort of a building block that you can derive information from, but by itself, all right, doesn't give you anything that is meaningful at all, and not, definitely nothing that you could make decisions off of. What would some pieces of information, along with this $40,000 uh, of revenue in July, that you would want to know before you decided whether they had a good month or not? Expenses. Okay. What their expenses are. Sure. If they took in $40,000 and their expenses were $30,000, okay, well, they made $10,000 profit. Now you know something about it. They covered their expenses plus $10,000. What's another thing that you might want to know? Projected income. Projected income. Very good. How much did they expect to make in July? You know? <laughs> if you order a pizza and they tell you it's going to be there in 15 minutes, and it's there in a half hour, you're going to be angry, right? On the other hand, if they tell you it's going to be there in 45 minutes and it's there in a half hour, you're going to be elated. Same half hour, in one case you're angry, in one case you're not. Why? Because of expectations. So $40,000 of revenue might be great if you're expecting $30,000. It might not be so great if you're expecting $50,000. What's something else that you might want to know? To, to try to make sense of this number and to, to get a sense of what that number means for the organization. Previous months. Previous months. So maybe you would want to know what the revenue was in June. All right. And again, depending on the business, maybe you'd want to know even what the revenue was in July 2010. You know, especially if it's some sort of seasonal business that has typical peaks and valleys throughout the year. It might not be relevant to compare it to the previous year, uh, a month, but it might be more relevant to compare it to um, the, the same month of a previous year. These are all good ways that we could take this one piece of data and transform it into information. All right? Now, what are ways that data gets transformed into information? We already saw one way, by combining with other data. All right? This piece of data by itself doesn't mean anything if we look at it in conjunction with these other pieces of data, then all of a sudden we're getting some insight into the situation. So one way that we can transform data into information is to combine it with other data. Is there any other way that we can transform data and information? Maybe not this $40,000 case, but, but other cases. 
compare it. Compare to to what? All right. Comparing data. Anything else? Maybe filtering the data. If you worked at an accounts receivable and you were responsible for billing your customers, would you be interested in seeing every customer's balance? No. You might be just interested in the people that are more than a certain uh, amount uh, late. You know, maybe people that are, you know, seven days or more late on their bill, you might be interested in. So you might want a report that would filter out. Uh, and if someone was on time with their bills, okay, you don't need to address that issue. But if someone was, was, was behind in their payments, you might want to see those, those people. If you're a library, do you want to see every book that everyone has checked out? No. You might be interested in the overdue books so that you can call those people and do something with it. Again, the raw facts of a gigantic list of everything that everyone's taken out of the library doesn't mean anything. It's not actionable. You can't do anything with that list, or you can't easily do anything with that list. But you start filtering it, all right, to uh, show stuff that meets certain criteria, then you can take action on it. Um, another thing I would say to do is summarize the data, all right? For example, you know, getting back to our um, 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 cafeteria example, they may not necessarily care, you know, how many hamburgers were sold on Monday, how many were sold on Tuesday, how many. They might just want to summarize and see for the week. Because, you know, they place orders maybe on a weekly basis. And, yeah, to see every single day doesn't really give them anything they can deal with. But if you can summarize for a period of time, yeah, that might do it. All right? The first thing I would say, the first important thing I would say in transforming data to information the more flexible you are about doing this the better this really gets to the advantages of relational databases and next you know we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about this today and we'll, we'll bring this up uh, on Thursday. But an alternative for storing things in relational databases might be storing things in files that are like spreadsheets or in spreadsheets. All right? Spreadsheets are good for the purpose that they're designed for, but the problem with spreadsheets is that they're very rigid. They're a rigid layout. This is how the data is laid out. It's difficult to match up data with other data, to filter data out. Well, maybe not filtering. That's pretty easy in spreadsheets. But to combine data and so on. Spreadsheets are a much more rigid way of storing data than relational databases. So one of the keys in being effective in transforming data into information is the more flexible you can be, the better. The more flexible you are about that, the better. The more timely you can be about that, the better. All right? One of the big innovations of Walmart, one of the keys to their success is getting timely inventory information. All right? Um, we talked a little bit about inventory when we talked about the cafeteria, right? Every organization wants to find the right amount of inventory for them to keep. You keep too little, what's the problem? Well, you have people that want to buy something that you don't have. You keep too much, what's the problem? Well, you have a bunch of stuff sitting on the shelf and not going anywhere. What Walmart was able to do is with the timeliness of their inventory, um, get better information and do a better job of transforming that raw data into information. 
Now, the last thing about transforming data into information is the more accurate the data, the better the information. And that, you know, that, that should be a given, but it, it, it benefits us to say it because when we start looking at databases, we'll look at ways that databases can help ensure that the data is accurate. If, for example, your information about how much you paid for the ingredients in the meal wasn't accurate, how is your decision about what to charge for it going to be good? All right. If you paid twice as much as you thought you did for the ingredients, then the price that you set is going to be wrong and you're not going to earn any money. So if your data is in inaccurate, the information coming from it isn't very good. One of the oldest acronyms in the computing business is GIGL, which stands for garbage in, garbage out. All right. So, our goal as an IT uh, part of an organization, among other things, is to do as good a job as we can in transforming that data into information. The more flexible we can be about it, the better. The more timely we can do it, the better. And the more accurate we can ensure our data is, the better. What we will look at next time are the ways at which using relational databases contribute to making or, or adding flexibility probably adding timeliness and definitely add or adding accuracy. Um, the, the, a lot of people call today, you know, the information age and, and, and say really that companies live and die based on their information and people call this a knowledge economy and you hear all those terms thrown back and forth. What that means is, is the quality of the information that an organization has really is critical to their success. And you can point to any number of success stories in businesses, whether it be Walmart as one, all right, uh, with the way Walmart manages their inventory, Dell computers with the way they manage their inventory, you know. Dell doesn't make anything, right? What do they do? They get stuff from people and put together computers, all right? Well, how are they successful? Because they do it real efficiently. How do they do it real efficiently? By managing their inventory very, very well. All right. How do they manage their inventory very, very well? By having very good information. <laughs> How do they get good information? Well, by making sure it's accurate, by making sure it's timely, and making sure that they're flexible in the manner in which they can process. So I want to cover this first because it's very easy to get caught up in the technical aspects of databases and, and normalization rules and primary keys and foreign keys and all that. Let's really remember and let's focus on why we're doing this to begin with. All right? We're doing this to serve a need within the organization. And by and large, that need is to provide the information that that organization needs to do their job. And to as good a degree as we can do this, the better a job that we can do and gives a potential anyhow for the organization being more successful. Obviously that by itself isn't going to do it, right? You can provide the best information in the world and if the management doesn't take it to the next level of knowledge or insight or understanding and they lack the sufficient judgment to handle the information right, then, you know. But again, our job as IT folks is to get them that information. and. Uh, then it's up to the management folks to, uh, to deal with it properly. Are there any questions at this point? All right. Uh, again, the lab is your time to work on the stuff. So um, we'll go over there. You can take a look at what's assigned for lab and you can begin uh, working on it. All right. We'll see you over there.